Israel is facing new accusations that it's been torturing Palestinians held in Israeli prisons. A new report by the United Nations Human Rights Office found at least 53 Palestinian detainees have died in Israeli custody since October 7th. The UN also found Palestinian prisoners have faced multiple forms of torture, including waterboarding, sleep deprivation, starvation, electric shocks, and the release of threatening dogs. The UN says most of the Palestinian men, women, children, doctors, journalists, and human rights defenders jailed by Israel are being held without charge or trial in deplorable conditions. The UN report was released on Tuesday, a day after a group of far-right Israeli protesters, including members of the Knesset, broke into two Israeli military bases in an effort to prevent Israeli military police from detaining nine soldiers suspected of torturing Palestinian prisoners. The nine soldiers are reportedly being investigated for gang raping a Palestinian prisoner at Sadeh Teman, a facility where prisoners from Gaza say they've been routinely beaten and tortured. We're joined right now by two guests who've been following the story closely. Diana Butu is with us, Palestinian human rights attorney, former advisor to the negotiating team at the Palestine Liberation Organization. Her new piece for Zateo is headlined, Rioting for the Right to Rape Palestinians. Her previous piece headlined, I spoke to Palestinians tortured by Israel. What they endured is unimaginable. Also with us, Oren Ziv, reporter and photographer for 972 Magazine. His latest piece just out, A Riot for Impunity, shows Israel's proud embrace of its crimes. Diana Butu, let's start with you. Explain what you found in these prisons and the significance of these revelations and this protest that broke out this week, trying to protect Israeli soldiers who were being arrested by Israel, involved with the rape of one of the Palestinian prisoners in the jail. Thank you, Amy. Look, I think it's important for people to understand that Israel has arrested somewhere up to the tune of 21,000 Palestinians. We don't actually even have the correct number because that information has been held back. And of these thousands of people who have been who have been imprisoned, they've been imprisoned without charge, without trial, and in effect kidnapped. The people who have been released, and I've spoken to a number of them, all of them have reported have been reporting the exact same treatment of extreme abuse, of torture, of being shackled 24 hours a day, of being kept in a fetal position, of being forced to um, to eat food that is that is inhumane, of being uh, deprived water, of of being many of them have talked about being raped, of uh, of being electric shocked, of of sleep deprivation, you name it. And the people with whom I've spoken are, are young, some of them are teenagers, and some of them are older. And the stories that are coming out from these prisoners is absolutely appalling. The fact that Israel can continue to do this with impunity is what is so alarming, because nobody has been holding back. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We have the minister, the Israeli minister, who is in charge of the prisons, who has come out and said very unequivocally that the way that we can deal with um, overcrowding in prisons is to institute the death penalty. He himself has been reported as being one of the individuals who carried out torture against Palestinian um, against Palestinians who've been kidnapped. And so the situation that we hear um, of these people who've been coming out of State Teman, by the way, Palestinians call it the slaughterhouse, is absolutely horrifying. Now, what happened on Monday was that uh, for some reason, we're not entirely sure why, there was uh, an attempt on the part of the Israeli military to try to question, and that's it, just question, nine members of the Israeli army who are accused of gang raping one Palestinian um, man. And rather than, rather than people backing, uh, backing the military police or saying, we don't want this done, it was quite the opposite. We ended up seeing two riots, one in the actual prison camp itself, it's a torture camp called State Teman, and another one in another um, military base where there were not just rioters, but people who are members of the Knesset, including members of the cabinet, who came forward and said that these people are heroes and that there should be no restraints put whatsoever on, on Israeli soldiers. So the picture that is coming out is quite dire, and of course, nobody's doing anything about it. Oren Ziv, uh, you're a reporter and photographer for 972 Magazine. You have a piece out just today headlined, A Riot for Impunity Shows Israel's 
proud embrace of its crimes. If you could lay out your argument, uh, you write that far-right protesters, soldiers, and MKs, that is, members of the Knesset, rallied for guards suspected of raping a Palestinian detainee. Once fringe, they are now the public face of the state. If you could elaborate. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's important to to notice that while the Israeli media try to portray it as a struggle between the mob and the state or between the army and, and the police that was not uh, preventing this riot, although requested, I think it's important to see that today, because Ben Gvir and their allies are in the government and are leading those demonstrations, including breaking into state Iman, they are the face of the state and those people are not extremists, they're the mainstream Israelis nowadays. In that, in that sense, their sense of anger and surprise can be understood because from the beginning of the war, since October, there was full or almost full impunity for soldiers. So it's, we still don't know why this specific case was investigated and, and is being proceeded. But we, as Diana said, we're hearing many horrific evidence from prisoners that were released to Gaza, to the West Bank or into 48 Israel. And... It's not a unique case. So from the protester side, they understood, they understood, and the soldier, as we published in different investigations, the soldiers on the ground understood they have full impunity. They were looting, they were killing, they were shooting from the sky, from the ground. And the Israeli public got the sense from the politicians declaring, but also just from the day-to-day -day war that soldiers are allowed to do whatever they want. And when an incident like this come, a very rare incident that the military police is coming and arresting or detaining a few soldiers for questioning and might take them to court, uh, people are angry because they, were, they believe that the, the Israeli military is allowed and have a backup to do anything. And this also shows us how Israel got to the ICC and to the ICJ with this kind of approach. Oren, you were at Beit Lid Army Base on Monday, where the protests were taking place. Explain where that is and where Tseteman is, these two jails, prisons. Uh, Tseteman is an army base near Be'er Sheva in southern Israel. And uh, Beit Lid, where they were held, questioned, and later also brought to a military court, is between in central Israel, not far so from the West Bank town of Tulkarem. Uh, so the protests on Monday started at Zdeteman with uh, members of the government breaking into uh, the place. And later, when they understood the soldiers were transferred to Betlid army base, to the military court and detention center, they moved there. Uh, also there, members of the government and of the Knesset arrived and were inciting against uh, uh, the army. And also there, there were hundreds of people breaking into the military compound. Uh, and at the protest, you could see also armed men uh, with uniform and military weapons, probably uh, soldiers, reservist soldiers that are friends or colleagues of the soldiers uh, arrested. And they were protesting against the army with the army uniform and weapons. And this is a very common uh, for Palestinians and activists in the West Bank when you have soldiers that are actually settlers or a mixture of that. But inside Israel, since the beginning of the war, we haven't seen much of that, of this kind of uh, militias operating. And, and there were, of course, also masks. And in general, towards them, but towards also the people who were breaking into the army base, uh, the police was doing absolutely nothing. Uh, as we learned later, the police was just, despite the fact the army was calling uh, for the police, they just didn't show up. And the few policemen that were there were not doing much. I think it's important to see that this is kind of a struggle between the old establishment, maybe the center left or the old people in the army that, you know, believe that Israel has had has to have some legal framework, like to do the crime towards Palestinians, but to keep them proportional and something to investigate, to have some uh, illusion or to, to present that Israel is investigating itself. And the other side is people like Ben Gvir, ben -Gvir and his their allies that think that soldiers should have full impunity and also are proud in their crimes, in the attacks against Palestinians. They document it on social media, as we've seen. 
And this is kind of the clash that is happening in the moment. And Diana, could you explain, you spoke to a young man named Bilal who described what he called engineered torture methods that were designed to break Palestinians. Yes, what he talked to me about uh, was that everything that was done was not, you know, people often think of torture, and by the way, it should never be used, but people often think of torture as a means to try to extract information, and even then it's illegal. But in this case, it wasn't at all uh, designed to extract information. It was just as a form of eternal punishment to show who is supreme. So he talked about how his hands and his legs were shackled, that there was a circle that was drawn around him with his eyes blindfolded and kept in a fetal position for 24 hours a day, that if he moved outside of the chalk, uh, that he would be tortured. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just him being tortured. He was then forced to, wit to witness other people being tortured as well. So he himself, uh, the only time the blindfold was removed was to see other people being tortured, other people being raped. He also talked to me about how the small quantities of food that were being given to them, so much so that he got to the point where he was looking to see exactly how many calories were written on the on the various um, containers that he was given, because the whole point was to try to control how much food they were taking in. He ended up losing a substantial amount of weight while being held in prison and is, is still undergoing very serious health problems because he was not allowed uh, to use the bathroom for a number uh, for for about 60 days. Um, he also talked about how they that all all of the prisoners who've emerged, uh, all of these kidnapped people, have scabies on them. They were they were denied the ability to take showers, and they were denied the ability to have even drinking water. So all of this he said was just as a means of showing who it is who is boss. They weren't at all doing torture to extract information. Again, that is illegal and should not be conducted. But in this case, it was a question of exerting one's superiority over them. He wanted, they were told that they must understand that Israel is superior and that Israel can exact re revenge anytime it wants. This is Dr. Mohammed Abu Samea, the director of Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza, who himself was jailed by Israel for seven months without charge. We were subjected to severe torture, and my little finger was broken. I was repeatedly subjected to hitting on the head, causing bleeding multiple times. There was almost daily torture in the Israeli prisons. When prisoners' cells were raided daily, they were severely beaten every day. We say this with full certainty, and we lived through it with great bitterness. Colleagues working in the Ministry of Health and other prisoners got out with us today. About 50 prisoners. We left behind many prisoners, tens of thousands of prisoners, living in hardship, experiencing psychological and physical torture that no Palestinian prisoner has experienced since the Nakba in 1948. Our brave prisoners are subjected to all kinds of tortures behind bars. Even the older prisoners, who have spent tens of years in the occupation prisons, have been deprived of all of their most basic rights. Many prisoners have died while they were in interrogation and were deprived of medicine and food. Again, that's Dr. Mohammed Abu Salmeya, the director of Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza, who himself was jailed by Israel for seven months, only recently released. And then you have Palestinian attorney Khaled Mahajna, who was the first lawyer to visit State Teman. He said the situation there is more horrific than anything we've heard about Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. We hear about people losing their limbs because they were handcuffed so tightly for so long. Diana Butu, as we wrap up, your final comments about what's happening and where the investigations are going for this and who is being held accountable. This is a, a concentration camp, is a torture camp, where, as Khaled has already mentioned, we've seen that people have been, had their limbs chopped off, oftentimes without anesthesia, by the way, where all segments of society are now complicit in this. And the fact that we don't see any investigations or even a push for investigations inside Israel, but to the contrary, we see people who are pushing for the right to be able to torture and rape, it shows you exactly where Israeli society is, and it shows you that there's a failure on the part of the international system to hold Israel accountable.